All right, again, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for part two of our Be Notice webinar series. I am Lauren Skinner Johnson with Convey Compliance and I will be your moderator. Just want to run through a couple of quick housekeeping things before we begin. Everyone is on mute, so if you do have a question, please type it in the Q&A or the chat box on the right-hand panel um, on the right-hand side of your screen. And then we'll review all the questions and try to get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation today. We do have quite a large audience, so we'll do our very best to get to as many questions as we can. Also, Convey hosts an annual tax and regulatory conference. It's called the C2 Summit, and this year it's going to be held at the Omni Shoreham Hotel in Washington, D.C., September 28th through September 30th. And for attending today's webinar, we'd like to offer you a discount of $100 if you go ahead and register for the, su the summit. Um, the summit is a live tax information reporting seminar that's about two and a half days of regulatory compliance and convey solution sessions. Um, you'll also see some sessions on B notices and penalty abatement. So if you have any other questions or need some additional information, please visit www.c2summit.convey.com. Now I'd like to introduce Neil Lefevre, Product Manager for Convey Compliance. Neil is going to walk us through some of the B notice and penalty notice best practices, including proactive validation and solicitation packets, as well as some penalty abatement best practices. Um, but before I hand it over to Neil, I'd like to ask a couple of polling questions. The first question is, do you use the IRS TIN matching program? And here's the poll for you. Answer A is yes, interactive matching. B, yes, bulk matching. C, yes, both interactive and bulk. D, no, I don't use the program. Or E, I don't know. I'll give you a second to answer. Great, thank you for responding to that one. And we have one other polling question we'd like to run by you. Question is, do you proactively solicit clients and or vendors who have incorrect TIN and name combinations? Yes, no, or I don't know. And here's the poll for that. We'll give you another minute to quick answer that question. Great, thank you for your participation in the polls. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Neil. Great, thanks Lauren. So just to kind of cover uh, the agenda quickly, um, we're gonna spend the first, uh, about half of the presentation talking about uh, eliminating notices. Uh, and that's through proactive uh, validation of clients and or vendors uh, and sending proactive solicitation packets. Uh, really the best way to handle and, and have best practices around B&P notices is to not get them at all. So that's where we're gonna spend about half of our time. Uh, and then the second half, uh, we'll cover uh, BNP notice best practices as well as abatement best practices uh, should you actually receive a B or P notice at year end. So uh, for those of you who were in the first webinar, uh, we showed this slide and we really focused the conversation around uh, the right hand uh, side of the graph. And that's really on a reactive approach. So you get a BRP notice from the IRS and you take the appropriate steps to solicit and remediate that BRP notice. Uh, and this presentation, we're gonna focus on kind of the first three bubbles, which are more proactive approaches, uh, or the first half of the presentation will be on the proactive piece uh, and then we'll get into uh, some best practices. So uh, we'll cover uh, real-time or interactive uh, TIN matching, both TIN matching and uh, general solicitation delivery uh, in the beginning. So just to kind of recap as well, 
Uh, the timeline, uh, we showed this in the first webinar as well. Uh, you know, in general, you print and file your forms uh, in January, or you, you print and mail your forms in January. In April, you transmit them to the IRS. And then October, uh, November, you deal with the B notices that you receive. And then in August, you deal with the penalty notices that you receive. So that was kind of the timeline that we covered in the first presentation. And really what we're talking about today is moving ahead of that timeline. So uh, what we want to talk about is how do we get rid of B and P notices altogether? And you can really start to do that uh, at the account initiation timeline and also before January. So before you even print and mail B notices, you know, really your best practices should begin here. So uh, all of us bring on a new client or vendor and there's some sort of setup process that occurs. You're in some cases just collecting the information on a form. In some cases, you're getting an actual W-9 at that time, putting that data in your systems, filling out the proper paperwork and activating that account. Uh, and then throughout the year, before January and year end happens, uh, that vendor or that client is performing some sort of work or delivering some sort of deliverable and then you're paying that, that individual or that organization for the work performed. Uh, so uh, what we wanna spend a couple minutes on is talking about how to move ahead of the January timeframe and really get proactive uh, in making sure the information is correct to avoid this whole B&P notice process in general, which is really the best practice that you can have. So uh, in the beginning, we asked about uh, TIN matching and how many folks use TIN matching. So very quickly, uh, the IRS uh, offers what they call TIN matching. They started offering it about uh, five or six years ago. And what it allows you to do is uh, proactively ask the IRS uh, via uh, a real-time web interface or uh, through a bulk file uh, if the information you have is correct. So you can log into the website, type in a TIN or EIN number and name, and the IRS will tell you, yes, this information is correct or no, this information is incorrect. Uh, they also have what's called bulk TIN matching uh, where you can submit a file and the IRS will return that file with a yes or no answer, essentially, uh, on each record that you submit. So I, I don't want to get into too many details about this process, uh, but there is an IRS publication 2108A uh, where you can read more about it, uh, but we definitely recommend that you use this program uh, and we'll talk about how you can use this program to avoid, avoid these BNP notices in a minute. Uh, the one thing I do want to mention about the TIN matching program is that uh, it does take some time to set up uh, this process. So you're going to have to submit your SSN and your uh, AGI or adjusted gross income. That's how the IRS verifies who you are. Uh, and you also need an officer, someone at like a VP type level uh, to actually enable your company to use the TIN matching program. So uh, if you do have any problems setting up this program, you can definitely contact an organization like Convey and we can help you out um, by doing some of that matching uh, on your behalf. So. How do we avoid all these B&P notices? So I talked about account initiation. Uh, really from a best practices standpoint, you know, getting the information from uh, the vendor or the individual uh, you know, is a great first step. Requiring that W-9 uh, right when they're setting up the account you know, is best practice, but guess what? Sometimes they fill out that information and it's wrong. Uh, the W-9 is, you know, uh, there's a number that is transposed or they just uh, fill it out quickly and don't pay attention and there's a misspelling uh, and that is what's going to lead you to a B notice the next year. So, uh, you know, there are some steps you can take to kind of avoid that pitfall and it's using the IRS interactive team matching program. So what, what we recommend is that when you're setting up a new vendor or a new client, you are running that TIN and name, even if you have a W-9 and you made them fill out a W-9, to enter that information in the IRS website and get a positive confirmation that what they've provided is correct. Uh, should you do that, you've pretty much guaranteed that you're not going to receive a B notice and the information that you're filing to the IRS is correct. Kind of the end all be all, you know, the ultimate goal is if you can automatically integrate uh, that validation into your account setup process. So what a lot of organizations we see are doing today is they're just logging into the IRS website, they're manually keying in that information and getting the confirmation. 
Um, we've actually worked with a number of clients. We offer a web service API, and you can actually integrate that into your account setup process. So you just key that information in once, and then um, through Convey's web service, it will actually validate that pin and name on the fly for you uh, within your source system. So it's kind of a much uh, speedier and convenient way. It avoids double typing. It avoids you typing it into the IRS site correctly, but then miskeying it in your source system, uh, for example. So uh, that's kind of, you know, something that we would recommend that you do starting, you know, from today forward with all your vendors, and it's going to virtually eliminate fee notices uh, once you get that in place. But what do you do with all the records that you currently have on file? Maybe uh, you have a whole bunch of vendors that you signed up this year, you've been doing business uh, with them for a while. Uh, how do you make sure that those vendors and recipients are correct? Well, I mentioned that the IRS offers this bulk TIN matching program. And what you can do is you can submit up to 100,000 records at a time, and the IRS will alert you which ones are correct and which ones are in incorrect. Uh, so what we recommend doing is to validate your entire vendor or client database, figure out which records are incorrect, and from there start a proactive solicitation process. And the advantage to that is if you do this before you get a VRP notice, you can get the information corrected before you submit it to the IRS, uh, thereby avoiding that B notice. So what you want to do is get your population of records that are incorrect. You want to solicit them, and we'll talk about some different solicitation packets that you can use to do that. Uh, you want to get those responses back. It could be a W-9 or a variety of other mechanisms. You want to update the data in your internal system, and then ideally you want to re match what they've given back to you. Uh, it's been our experience that you know, there's a certain percentage of data collected back that's still incorrect for uh, various reasons. So ideally, you want to tin match that data again and then further figure out if anyone has sub still submitted incorrect information. For all the ones that are still incorrect, you want to basically begin that process of solicitations again. So send out the solicitation, collect the responses, and keep repeating that process until you've cleansed uh, your current data and um, before you file it with the IRS. Uh, the one thing to note is that the IRS does have uh, some rules around the bulk tin matching program, and if you violate those rules, they will lock you out for 96 hours. So they put some rules in place to make sure that people aren't, um, for example, submitting a tin with a whole bunch of different names and trying to figure out uh, what the correct name is uh, or just guessing. So uh, you are going to want to check that, that IRS publication to make sure you're abiding by those rules. Or if you're using a third party like Convey, um, you know, a lot of those rules and lockout preventions are already in place and will automatically make sure we create files that don't get you locked out uh, from the IRS system. So um, I'm talking about proactively, uh, you know, collecting this information before you submit it to the IRS. Uh, you also should be taking this approach after you submit your information to the IRS as well. So uh, if, you re if you're responding to a B notice, uh, you do, um, you know, you do have certain rules and regulations that you have to follow, but once you follow those rules, uh, it's kind of up to you and how you continue to solicit to get good information. So uh, when you get a B notice, you do have to send it a W-9 out or a uh, second B notice letter, but once you've satisfied that requirement, you can then go above and beyond that uh, and take additional steps to correct the information. So uh, whether you've whether it's data you haven't submitted yet or you have submitted it uh, to the IRS. Um, you know, we've worked with our clients uh, in a variety of ways to get correct information. Uh, the first one is uh, mailing them a W-9. So if you're in a first or second B notice, or sorry, if you're in a first B notice state, uh, you're required by the IRS to send a W-9, and there's no getting around that requirement. But uh, if you are signing up a new vendor and they haven't given you correct information, you still can send a W-9 uh, or equivalent form to collect that information. Uh, we've seen some success with organizations uh, doing email campaigns. So because we haven't submitted to the IRS and we're not on B notice, uh, you know, it's perfectly okay for us to send an email to that vendor uh, letting them know that the TIN and name that they have on file is incorrect and that they should uh, give us a call or go to our website to update that uh, information. Or maybe we're uh, sending them an email with a W-9 on it that they can download, uh, fill out, and mail back to us. 
Uh, another uh, campaign that we've done is uh, a letter or self-mailer. Again, this is just a letter stating uh, that the information uh, according to the IRS is incorrect and it might direct them to a website or uh, direct them to call us to collect that information. Uh, as well as a lot of organizations, you know, they're working with their merchants and clients, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, putting some sort of prompt in your customer service system so that if you are talking to a client uh, or an organization and the information is wrong, when you have them on the phone, you can collect that information right then and there and get it updated. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, working with organizations to create a portal on, on their website where you can log in and update uh, your recipient information and validate that it's correct. So again, these are, you know, just a variety of ways to collect that information, you know, ideally before you submit it to the IRS, uh, thus avoiding the B&P notice situation uh, altogether. And just to mention one more time, if you do get a B or P notice, you do have to follow the normal uh, rules and regulations around that. So for example, uh, sending someone um, a letter or uh, an email is not the appropriate steps you need to take. Uh, and we talked about what those were in, in the first webinar. So uh, make sure you are following those rules and you aren't uh, removing someone, for example, from back withholding uh, without receiving a proper W-9 or uh, SSA printout. So um, we spent uh, quite a bit of time talking about how to prevent B&P notices, which is where we all should be striving and where Convey works with us its clients to uh, get them to that state. But let's say there, you know, there's, let's be real, there's definitely a subset of, of clients that you're not going to get the correct information for, and you are going to get that B or P notice. So what are some things that you should be considering uh, to make this process uh, as painless and as cost effective as possible? So uh, the first thing that we're going to recommend when you get a B notice or a penalty notice is that you're going to want to load that data into your system or into your spreadsheet. I know based on the first webinar, a lot of folks are using uh, spreadsheets or, or a manual process to handle these B notices. You want to make sure that when you get the notices, they don't sit in your mailroom for a week or sit on someone's desk for a week because there are time deadlines associated with this. So uh, during uh, B and P notice season, uh, you definitely want to put the mailroom, for example, on alert that they should be looking for this and get it to you as quickly as possible. So you're going to, going to want to get the data loaded into your system uh, as quickly as possible and mailed out uh, to the organization or recipient it's intended for to get the correct information. Uh, we definitely want to avoid back withholding, so uh, we don't want to waste time with it just sitting there. Uh, the kind of third point on the slide is that the uh, timer starts uh, at notice date or when you receive the notice from the IRS. So this is a common uh, kind of pitfall that we see organizations fall into. They'll get their B notices and they'll have a notice date uh, and you have 30 days from the notice date or when you receive the information from the IRS. So sometimes the IRS isn't timely on mailing these out and if you get the uh, B notice, for example, the CP2100, uh, a couple weeks after the notice date that is on that B notice, uh, you actually technically have 30 days from the date you received it. So you've essentially bought yourself uh, two additional weeks to collect the correct information from your recipients or uh, organizations. Another thing that you're going to want to do is when you get your B and P notices, in the first webinar we talked about you have to take the B notice that you receive and compare it to your records to see if there's a match. Uh, if there's not a match, you don't have any solicitation responsibilities. Uh, what we see some folks do is they'll go back to their prior year data to do that comparison. And in a lot of cases, someone else in the organization has already updated the tenor name on that account, uh, thereby alleviating the solicitation requirements. So you're going to want to make sure when you're doing that comparison that you're looking at the most up-to-date records and not anything from uh, a prior year because you could send out a whole bunch of solicitations that you don't need to. Uh, also, uh, the IRS has what they call a supplemental uh, B notice. And if you've already solicited someone, you do not need to send them a second notice based on the supplemental run. So what do I mean by that? In the fall, you get your B notices, and that's usually the majority of your notices. And you send out your W-9s and your second B notice letters based off of that. 
If you make any corrections to your data, the IRS may send you a second uh, round of V-notices, usually in the spring, called the supplemental notices. Uh, if you've already solicited someone who appears on that supplemental notice run, uh, you've already satisfied your IRS requirements and you don't need to re-solicit any of those individuals in that supplemental run. So again, that's a situation where we see uh, a lot of people, especially if you're manually tracking this, uh, where they don't do that comparison to what they've mailed and they send out a whole bunch of solicitations uh, that they don't need to, uh, thereby incurring a lot of additional uh, print and mail costs. Uh, and then, as well, we talked a little bit about this in the last webinar. If you get a penalty notice for an individual and you've already mailed them a first or second B notice for that year, you do not need to send a second uh, solicitation uh, to that individual. So again, just doing that comparison back to what you sent uh, in the prior fall can alleviate uh, a lot of, of additional print and mail. So uh, next. Uh, when you send out any penalty notices, uh, first B notices, second B notices, uh, you want to make sure that the cover letter that you're sending to the recipient or organization uh, is clear and easy to understand. Uh, you know, a lot of times the IRS uses language which is hard for a normal person that is not involved in information reporting. It's, it's hard for them to understand and they don't really get why they're getting this information, why they have to send you a W-9. So taking extra time and care and creating that cover letter uh, can reduce uh, not only the amount of calls and questions that you're going to get, but also can increase your response rate uh, and greatly uh, reduce the amount of penalties that you may have to pay. Uh, any cover letter that you send on your first or second B notice should definitely include a phone number that they should call uh, if they have any questions or concerns. Uh, we've also seen organizations uh, put together FAQs that they include with the mailing or uh, a website that links to an FAQ or has additional information. Again, that's going to help alleviate a lot of calls to your call center when these mailings go out. Uh, the IRS does not require filing corrections for any W-9s that you receive. Uh, you can, but it's not required. And generally, it's not recommended to file a bunch of corrections based on W-9s that you receive. So when you get these W-9s, you should correct your information uh, and use it for future filings, but you do not need to go back to the, the prior three or five tax years and create a bunch of corrections and send those out uh, to your recipients, unless, of course, they request it uh, for their records. Then you would want to go ahead and, and fulfill that request. But in general, you, you don't need to make corrections uh, to prior years. So again, that's a situation where there's a lot of additional uh, print and mail that occurs that doesn't need to. So um, we're doing all this work to get all this corrected information uh, from our recipients. And probably the biggest uh, pitfall that we see is the tax department isn't working uh, as closely with the payment systems as they should be. So you get a W-9 back, you update your tax system. How are you getting that information back to the folks that are cutting the checks? Uh, what we often see happen is the W-9 comes in, the information is corrected uh, within the tax system, but those changes don't get routed to the payment systems. So what happens is the checks keep getting cut with the wrong uh, TIN or name on them. And at year end, when the payment system gives you the information to report on the 1099s, guess what? It's all reverted back to the old TIN and name, thereby creating this kind of cycle of correcting the information, getting fed back bad information, correcting it, so on and so forth. And essentially, you get to a situation where you're doing a bunch of work uh, that's not really getting you anywhere and you end up having frustrated uh, accounts or clients uh, who are ask, calling you and asking you why you keep sending me these W-9s every year. I send you the updated information and not only is my 1099 wrong, but I have to fill out this W-9 again. So you definitely want to work with your source systems or payment systems and have a way or system to feed this information back to them uh, so that they update it and future payments uh, are corrected. And then, of course, all this information that we're talking about, uh, if you're doing it manually, uh, can be kind of hectic and, and burdensome. Uh, we recommend getting a system. Uh, there's a lot of them out there. Uh, Convey offers a few of them, which will help automate this entire process. So uh, everything from comparing what you've mailed to what you're receiving, uh, providing data files back to your source systems, 
these are all things that you should work towards getting uh, fully automated and not doing via any sort of spreadsheet or manual process. So, um, at, at the end of all this, you know, the IRS, uh, for anything that's incorrect, is going to send you a penalty notice, which we discussed in the last webinar. Uh, and I just wanted to run through a couple things that you should be thinking about uh, throughout your TIN compliance uh, process, which will help you in that abatement process when you get to that point. So, uh, first and foremost, you're going to want to make sure that uh, everything you're doing is documented. Uh, everything from the processes and procedures, uh, as well as the data going in and out of the system. So uh, this is especially critical if you ever do get an audit um, from the IRS. They are going to want to see documented processes and procedures, and this can definitely help in the abatement process uh, as well. So uh, track year-over-year -year progress. Uh, every year, the amount of B notices that you're getting is continually going down. That's a great argument that you can use in the abatement process, and it should be included in your abatement letter to the IRS to show that you're taking the appropriate steps, you have the appropriate processes in place, uh, and you know really it's, it's the vendors who aren't giving you the correct information or the clients, um, but you are taking the appropriate steps. So showing that year-over-year -year progress goes a long way uh, in getting that penalty abated. You're also going to want to check uh, track all of the metrics associated with your uh, B, B notices and penalty notices. So how many B notices you received, how many uh, you mailed first B notice, how many you mailed second B notice, how many re responses you received to each, and how many you mailed that you never received a response for. You're going to want to make sure that all of that information uh, is captured uh, and in general you're going to want to include that as part of your abatement letter. Uh, it's going to show that you're doing that due diligence to the IRS. And then with everything, you know, the W-9s that you're collecting and anything else that your uh, clients are sending you in this process, you're going to want to make sure that you hold on to those. Ideally, you're scanning those and keeping a digital copy so that you don't have uh, boxes of paper laying around all over the place. But you should keep a digital copy of all these forms. Uh, in a lot of cases, the IRS will ask you for uh, a copy of um, certain W-9s to prove that you are getting the corrected information uh, via a W-9. So uh, what, what we have on this slide is uh, a sample abatement letter, and this is actually something you can get from our website. Uh, and this is kind of a generic letter that we've put together. Uh, we've worked with different clients uh, over the years, uh, and we've created kind of this template which will help kind of be a starting point in the abatement process uh, if you've never done this before, or even if you have, it's a great uh, kind of checkpoint uh, to compare what we've put together versus what you're doing. You might get some ideas for some additional data points you can uh, include to further state your case to the IRS and avoid that penalty. So this is out on our website, and uh, there is um, we will provide uh, links uh, in the email that we send that will get you uh, to this letter for comparison. But again, the general goal of this, you know, letter is to take all those matrix and all the metrics, excuse me, uh, and documentation that you've collected uh, in your B and P notice process, include that in this letter to help show that reasonable cause uh, as to why the information is correct and to abate that penalty. And then just a, another reminder that you do need to send this abatement letter within 45 days, uh, or the IRS will assess uh, the full penalty. So. Make sure that you are getting this information back to the IRS uh, in a reasonable manner. Uh, so real quick, uh, just a couple uh, key takeaways. Uh, hopefully uh, you got from the first part of this presentation that really the, you know, the best practice is to eliminate B notices uh, altogether. So take the steps to proactively use real-time TIN matching uh, or interactive TIN matching at account setup, uh, as well as bulk TIN matching to find out which uh, clients you need to work with to correct the information before you submit to the IRS to avoid the notices altogether. Now that's the ultimate goal that you should be striving for. Uh, document everything. Uh, it's going to be extremely hard to abate any penalties that you have without the proper documentation. So make sure that the tools that you're using are properly tracking first and second B notices and the metrics associated uh, with them. And then finally, uh, if you are using a manual process or spreadsheets, make sure you know there, you should really be looking at outside tools and, and organizations to help you with this process. 
Uh, they can help automate and really minimize the manual processes uh, that you're going through and greatly reduce, you know, the print and mail costs that you're um, currently uh, incurring. So uh, companies like Convey are, are out there and we can help you with that. Uh, and, and in a lot of cases, the, you know, the cost savings that you're going to see uh, is going to pay for the actual tool itself. Um, so with that, I will turn it um, back over to Lauren. Great. Thanks, Neil. Um, we will probably take just a couple of minutes here and um, go through some of the questions that we, we have received. Um, probably the most popular question that we get is, is this recorded and will the slides be available? And the answer to both of those questions is yes. Um, this webinar as well as part one has been recorded and these slides for both presentations will be available to you. And with that, we're going to go through a couple of the questions that we've received today, if you guys don't mind hanging on the phone for just a couple more minutes. All right, question number one, how do you access the IRS TIN matching program? Uh, great question. So um, I'm not going to go through all the steps because it is uh, sort of lengthy, but I would recommend that you uh, get IRS Publication 2108A, and that will tell you the full steps, but again, it is uh, extremely cumbersome. Um, you do need uh, a lot of personal information as well as an officer uh, of the company uh, to help you sign up with that process. The other option is to appoint a third party um, who can actually do some of that matching uh, on your behalf, so an organization like Convey can, can do some of that matching and help you with that process. Along those same lines, there's a question um, regarding the cost for the TIN matching program. Is there a cost for this program? Uh, there is not a cost for the TIN matching program, so you definitely should sign up. It's just, you know, can you get someone within your organization to, uh, you know, an officer to actually sign up uh, and take responsibility for that. But um, if you can get through the sign-up process, uh, which normally takes about uh, 15 to 30 or 45 days, uh, there is no cost for it. All right, next question. What should you do if a vendor changes their name and the W-9 has a new name, but it does not match the IRS PIN match? Uh, another great question. So this is common for uh, whatever reason. <laughs> uh, sometimes you get that W-9 back and they've made an adjustment, but it's still not uh, the right adjustment. So uh, in that case, you're doing the right thing. You're re -tin matching that data. If it's still incorrect, you should reach back out uh, to that individual or organization. Uh, in a lot of cases, you might want to think about changing your messaging to that individual. So you might want to have a different cover letter which states, you know, thank you for the updated information. Uh, we've, you know, verified it or checked it with the IRS, but unfortunately it's still coming back as a mismatch or something along those lines uh, so that they just don't think that you're sending them the same thing and throw it out. So recognize that you receive the update, but inform them that it's still incorrect and that they should uh, verify their records. Okay, last question. We were recently notified by the IRS that the limit is now 70,000 records for bulk TIN matching. Is this accurate and have you heard this? Uh, that's a good question. I actually have not heard, of, heard that. Um, as far as I know, it's still 100,000 records uh, per file for the bulk TIN matching. Uh, but what we will do as an action is we will uh, contact our compliance folks and have them do some checking, and we will uh, put an updated uh, post on our uh, blog, which is 1099news.com, and we will uh, post an update to that question out there. Um, so we'll do some research and poking around and see what we can find, um, and again, put that post on 1099news.com. Great. Thanks, Neil. And thank you, everyone, for taking a couple of extra minutes to hang on the, on the line with us to go through some of those questions. Again, we have recorded this, and the slides will be available. Just keep an eye on your email. You'll probably see that come out early next week. Um, and then if you do have any more questions um, or want some more information on any of Convey's solutions, um, please visit us at convey.com or call one 888 303-1099. And that concludes our webinar today. Thank you guys for joining us and have a great afternoon.